Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope you're enjoying your second day of, uh, of Hello Tomorrow. Super happy to be with you today with an amazing panel of speakers to talk about carbon removal. Uh, my name is Ben. I'm uh, the founding partner of Marble, which is a climate tech venture studio. So we create co-create companies focusing on hard climate problems from deep decarbonization to adaptation to carbon removal. I'm super happy to be joined by uh, three amazing speakers. So Cara Maesano, your manager and geochemical lead uh, at the CDR initiative at RMI, formerly Rocky Mountain Institute, but now shortened as RMI, uh, which is a, a think tank and a research organization in the US that does a lot of work on the energy transition and climate tech. Uh, Frocker, uh, you're the head of science at Stripe Climates and uh, working in particular with Frontier, which is a 925 million advanced market commitment focusing on CDR, carbon dioxide removal. We're going to dive into what that means in a moment. And uh, Mindert, your associate professor at Harriet Watt University, working at the Research Center for Carbon Solutions. And we're going to dive into uh, all of your work, in particular in direct air capture. So first of all, we're going to talk about carbon removal. And maybe like a quick framing about what that means. So we're going to talk about removal, not carbon capture. And it's important to make the distinction. Carbon capture is when you prevent the CO2 from going in the atmosphere, for instance, from uh, cement plants. Carbon removal is when you take the CO2 that's already accumulated in the atmosphere, you remove it, and you sequester it for very long time scale. And we know that in addition to very, very fast and very, very deep decarbonization, we are going to need uh, a lot, like billions of tons of carbon removal um, by the, the middle of this century and beyond the middle of this century in order to meet our net zero targets. It's the only way that works. That's what's on the uh, IPCC uh, scenarios. Um, so I'd like to start uh, with you, Frocke. So because for people in the audience who know Stripe, Stripe is a, famous, a very, very famous company, one of the biggest internet uh, payment company. Why does Stripe work on carbon removal and what exactly is Frontier? Can you tell us more about that? Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, it, it might seem not obvious uh, at the start why a fintech company like Stripe would venture into carbon removal, but you know, Stripe's overall mission is um, to enable economic growth and, or as we put it, um, increase the GDP of the internet. And if you, you know, zoom out far enough into the future, you, you can imagine that climate change is the single most uh, threat to all the um, billions or millions of, of um, merchants that use Stripe every day. And so these businesses, uh, or like climate change is a threat to them. So, and if you phrase it that way, it makes sense that we would take action and um, I'm not close enough. Oh, okay, that changed, sorry. <laughs> Could you hear me? Anyways, we work on climate change by um, buying carbon removal. Um, yeah. Um, so, so in oh, the background, basically, sorry, that mic is really loud. <laughs> um, the solutions that we have today, so you said in, in addition to um, emission reduction, we need to remove gigatons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and permanently store it. So the solutions that we have today for that, for example, planting trees, aren't going to cut it. We're going to run out of arable land, and it's not permanent enough, as you said it. So the um, novel technologies that can do that usually start off being very expensive, and then um, we think that carbon removal is on a similar trajectory, for example, like solar panels or hard drive that can come down the cost curve with early adapters. So in 2019, Stripe um, started something like an experiment, and that was buying for $1 million permanent carbon removal. We didn't look for solutions that were very um, cheap and available, but rather for like novel, innovative ideas that would permanently remove carbon from the atmosphere and have a promise to maybe be cheap at scale. And what we saw was like um, a few things. So one, the, the field of these people building these businesses were like really starved for capital. So the, the response was really um, intense. But then we, then we also saw that, you know, we're nowhere near where we want to be. Like there's very little... Um, capital in these markets. So in, in, in order to really scale and, and make a difference, we launched Frontier. Um, 
or like one, one reason I want to make like is is all the background is um, the absence of a market. Like for there's a lot of founders in the room, and I wanted to ask you something, but the lights are so bright I can't even see anyone. <laughs> but for all the founders out there, you can imagine that the uncertainty of like a stable market or a customer is like a you know risk. You know who would launch. A business if you're not sure if there's a market and somebody able uh, somebody there on the end to buy it so with that in mind we launched frontier last year exactly one year ago um, as an advanced market commitment it's stripe alphabet meta mckinsey and um, uh, alphabet already shopify, said. shopify thank you <laughs> um, together we have like nine, 925 million million dollars to buy permanent carbon removal until 2030. Um, and, and how this works is that we, um, in, in Frontier, so we as internal experts, together with an et expert net network of commercial and academic um, experts in the field, vest carbon removal suppliers for um, uh, against uh, criteria that we have. So one one of the core things that we look for is like, does a solution permanently remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere? Does it have a pathway to be low cost at scale? Can it scale? And then um, also, is this verifiable? And I think we we're going to talk about verification a little bit um, later on. So that's that's basically what. Um, we do. We have like different purchase um, programs. Like one is one is pre-purchase agreements where we um, pay upfront before delivery for really high-risk early-stage technologies, and then we also do larger offtake agreements to really unlock project finance for carbon removal solutions that are ready to deploy and scale. Thank you, Throcke. So obviously, to, pro to buy this carbon removal, we need people working on the supply and the solutions, people in science, industry, uh, and, uh, and uh, in startups. So um, your lab, MindEarth, uh, works a lot on various pathways for CDR. Can you tell us more about, first of all, how you got into CDR as a scientist, and what the scope of, of the work that your lab does? Yeah. Thanks, Ben. Um, well, I mean, I, my focus is especially on direct air capture, but, but I also have colleagues working on, on uh, enhanced mineralization, for instance, enhanced weathering. Um, at some point, I, I, I come from CO2 capture and storage, so, so CO2 capture from, from uh, point sources originally, and I was very skeptical about direct air capture. And then at some point, I found myself in Switzerland uh, for a postdoc position, and there the mood was completely different. So there was a lot of enthusiasm about direct air capture, and I also got kind of infected with the virus. Um, and I found adsorption technology very interesting, so, so that, um, that led me to get into that, that topic. Um, my team specifically works on, on direct air capture with solid adsorbents, uh, and also does a little bit of work now with, with liquid solvents and then with electrochemical regeneration of that solvent. Um, but within the solid adsorbent space, we focus mo um, mostly on the, the interaction of water with, with, with CO2 because we all know that air is humid uh, and we need to know what the humidity does to the, to the CO2 uptake and the CO2 capture mechanisms uh, to, to be able to develop the best sorbents and to do our, our process modeling, etc. Uh, colleagues of mine also work on, on in, in, in silico uh, adsorbent discovery, which is fascinating. So basically, you give it a, a separation task. The, the, uh, they, they've built a, a platform or framework, and you give that um, kind of an assignment to uh, separate this CO2 from this stream, and it can be the air, for instance, and find me the optimal adsorbent then. And then there's a colleague who does a lot of work on, on ocean alkalinity enhancement and, and on uh, enhanced weathering. So that's basically what the research center uh, for, for carbon solutions um, ha has within its, its remit. Cool. Thank you, Mindert. And don't worry, we're going to zoom in on some of these techniques uh, in the, in the follow-up of the, of the conversation. Um, and Kara, can you tell us more about the CDR initiative at RMI? RMI is, has been doing a lot of work on the energy transition for decades. The CDR initiative is quite new, so can you tell us more about how it works, its scope, and its ambition? Yeah, thanks. Um, so the CDR initiative at RMI was started last July, and we're a small team, but what we do is um, we basically support the CDR ecosystem. We want to see it grow. Um, our goal is to make sure that we have CDR deployment and that it's done well, it's done effectively and thoughtfully, that it 
solves problems and doesn't create new ones. So, um, so yeah, it's really interesting work. Um, Excellent. Yeah. Thank you, Carol. Yeah. Um, so we, we're going first to zoom in into some um, uh, CDR approaches because obviously to be able to remove something between like four, five to maybe like 15 billions of tons of CO2 per year in the second half of the century, it's unlikely there's going to be one technique or one approach that's going to do all of it. So we need a portfolio of various CDR solutions. So one of the most popular one that we hear a lot uh, about in the press is direct air capture, for instance, and that's the focus of your work, Minder. So um, could you maybe explain a bit uh, how direct air capture works? What are maybe like the, the different types of direct air capture that people are building today? And what are some of the, um, the things we don't know about how direct air capture works today? I mean, direct air capture is no, no mean feat, right? Because what, what we're trying to do is to, to pick these little small CO2 molecules out of the air and to, to, to you know, to, to separate them from the other molecules in the air. And, and it's, been, it's been pointed out many times before during this, this conference that it, we only have 420 parts per million of, C, of CO2 in the air. It's actually a couple of hundred parts too many, but, but still it's difficult to get it out. So there, I mean, we've done like a, a, a recent review or overview study with, with partners at the RMI. It was, it was a lot of fun. Um, and we basically came to four broad categories. So you, you can let the CO2 uh, react with solid adsorbents or, or, or get it stuck to solid adsorbents, and then you need to regenerate these sorbents to get pure CO2 out. You can also uh, scrub it out of the air with liquid solvents. So those can be alkaline solvents or amine-based solvents. Um, and then furthermore, you could use membrane-based separation processes. Um, and then maybe a little bit of a funny one is, is cryogenic processes. I'm, I'm saying a funny one because you would need to, you know, reach very low temperatures to solidify CO2, and then basically you can um, take the solidified CO2 um, and, and, and have it in a pure form. Cool. Thank you. And um, el the electrochemistry pla um, systems that like part of the um, of these four is like another type of category. Yeah, so that, that will be a subcategorization, right? Okay. So, so if you have a liquid solvent, uh, you can regenerate that solvent with electrochemistry. Um, if you have a solid material, you can also, um, by changing the, the, the polarity of that material, for instance, you can let CO2 adsorb or desorb. So within the category, I mean, we categorize it this way, um, but... Um, you know, electrochemistry fits in, 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 in a couple of these boxes. We've, we've also seen electrochemical membranes, by the way. Yeah. So, yeah. A lot of various techniques uh, uh, being considered today. Um, maybe, Kara, we can zoom in on geochemical carbon removal, which is the type of carbon removal you, you focus on at RMI. There's even like several subcategories. So, can you maybe tell us how it works, the different approaches, and what are some of the knowledge gaps we have on, on this type of CDR? Sure, yeah. So geochemical CDR is basically another way to describe carbon mineralization. And mi carbon mineralizes all the time. This is, it's a natural process. It's been going on forever. It goes on forever. Um, this is what the Earth would do if we all just stopped existing or emitting. Like this, is, this is how the Earth would regulate uh, atmospheric carbon, carbon dioxide levels on its own. So it, it's a natural process, and I want to emphasize that part because I know people like to talk about nature-based solutions, mm. and really what they mean is like trees or soils. But geochemical CDR, is, uh, geochemical processes are also natural. They've actually been, along, been around a lot longer than plants and forests. So, um, but the, the goal is to try to enhance this and make it faster so that it happens on relevant timescales. And there are different ways to do that. Um, one, of the, one of the things we think about when, you know, so to mineralize CO2, basically you need CO2, you need water, and you need some kind of rock, like alkaline rock. Mm. And basalt, for example, is an alkaline rock. So volcanic rock, it's everywhere. We're not gonna run out of it. Um, so when we're talking about scale, it's an important point. But um, yeah, so you, you really just need those three ingredients and what happens is, I'm not sure how much I should get into the chemistry here, but yeah, you, you end up turning the, the, the CO2, you take the carbon from the CO2 and you, you solidify it, you, you turn it into rock. Um, and, uh, 
And yeah, there's lots of ways to do this. So one way is, um, this is what I was about to get to, is mm -hmm. one thing we care about is the surface area of the rock. Um, so one way to enhance this is to crush the rock and um, increase surface area, and you can make this, this happen a lot faster. Um, and, and, then you, and then what you do with that afterwards, I guess, dip, you know, is, is how we categorize the different methods. So you can just crush it and let it mineralize. You can crush it and force more CO2, um, you know, in, in a kind of reactor and like a, a you know, a, a, like a temperature controlled space, for example. Um, you can also spread it on farmland. It's called enhanced weathering, if you've heard of enhanced weathering. Um, you can spread it in the open ocean, for example, um, to reduce acidity and increase alkalinity. So, Can you maybe yeah. zoom in on about how that process works in particular? Because I think uh, maybe not everyone is familiar with the way OAE, like ocean alkalinity enhancement works. Like, how do you remove CO2 with that process exactly? Ah, yeah. Well, then I really have to, <laughs> to get into the chemistry. Yeah, I think you can get into the light um, chemistry. So I think it's fine. Yeah, I'll, maybe, maybe I'll keep it simple, just, yeah. just so it doesn't take too long. But yeah, um, I'm trying to think of a way to keep this simple. Um, yeah, I mean, there's also different ways to do ocean alkalinity, right? You yeah. can spread crushed rock, but you can also use electrochemistry to split the seawater. In that case, you don't need rock. You just yeah. need electrochemistry and seawater, and you can, split, um, you can split it into an acid and a base, keep the acid, and put the base back, for example. Right. So, so basically, you have this source of alkalinity, of alkaline rock, that you use in different deployment systems, either in an open system, typically like uh, on the farmland, like you mentioned, in, or open system like in the ocean. If you deacidify and you, 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 um, you basically um, um, ha have the, the ocean that will pump the CO2 to compensate the, the change of equilibrium between the different forms of dissolved CO2. And then you have this closed system, right? The, one, the kind of reactor that you mentioned, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess there's a lot of ways you can do this. And one of the cool things about, about these, uh, these processes is that even when we try to put them, them in right? buckets, you like it's not them. really possible because there are people yeah. doing, um, even one of the, the frontier purchase companies, I would have categorized it a different way <laughs> than how it's categorized. And actually, I, when we, we split these into like, you know, I've got three main buckets, but I would have, I, you can classify that that project is as all three. So th there's a lot of uh, interesting ways you can you can approach this. Yeah. Thanks, Kara. And Franco, maybe you want to react because also like at, with Frontier, so obviously you see a lot of different techniques. So there's like more than the two we just mentioned. So maybe we can say a few words about the bio, the ocean, and what you see as like the knowledge gaps happening in across all these. Yeah, sure. Um, I think I think you know the common theme, as Kara said and mine, There's like lots of way to categorize it. It's because it's a lot of is an emerging field, right? We are just starting to see the tip of the iceberg, basically, of all these solutions emerging that that can remove uh, carbon dioxide um, permanently from the atmosphere. And um, so there, there's a lot of ways of doing it. So looking at the ocean is particularly interesting because, you know, the oceans already like all the emissions and the the warming from uh, from human activity, the oceans already absorb like 30% of the CO2. In fact, the concentration in ocean water is like 40 times higher than in the air. So that makes it a little bit easier technically to, to extract CO2 from the ocean. So as Kara said, like there's multiple approaches. You can um, increase alkalinity of the ocean and therefore enhance basically the nat that natural phenomenon of the water being in equilibrium with the air and therefore drawing down CO2. It's particularly nice too because it counteracts uh, ocean acidification which is a threat to a lot of marine life and, and also food supply actually. Um, you, you mentioned direct ocean capture too which is like a process of uh, extracting for example with electrochemistry <laughs> Smoke. Uh, is this CO2, by the way? <laughs> Coming from Let, dry eyes? Let's capture it. Sorry, it's too funny. Let's, uh, this is probably like a very high CO2 concentration area. We should start a, a capture system here because it's probably... It's because we're on a geothermal <laughs> source, so we need to put a mini deck. Um, yeah. Got it, that's great. <laughs> one, one area or category of solutions that we haven't touched upon is like um, biomass-based yeah. approaches. So, for example, 
um, or like biology is particularly good, and we've I've actually have heard some interesting talks earlier on on um, how good biology is in using these like small concentrations of CO2 in the air in photosynthesis, right? Like so, plants uh, use CO2 all day to from the air and and build um, you know complex molecules from that. So there's a lot of approaches utilizing that capability of biology to turn CO2 um, into like stable mass. So you can, for example, pyrolyze, you know, waste from agriculture sector or, you know, forest waste in California. We have a lot of um, uh, waste from fire management in the woods that we don't really know. It's a real problem and we don't know what to do with, that, with it. So you can take that pyrolyzer, you extract energy that you can use in like heat or for electricity and then um, couple that to a form of permanent storage. And then there's, um, for example, like algae-based approaches, you can grow macroalgae like kelp in the ocean or algae in a bioreactor and then couple it to a form of permanent storage and then therefore remove carbon dioxide from the air. Yeah, super interesting what you say because I think a lot of people think naturally about photosynthesis as a way to do carbon removal because it's like it's been evolved, it's super powerful. But for anything relying on photosynthesis, the challenge is how do you store the carbon? How do you turn it into a storable uh, version that's for you know long term sequestration? Uh, and, and that's where the innovation is basically today. Absolutely, yeah. So for example, uh, one company that we that we early on uh, bought from is called Charm Industrial, and they. They take um, agricultural waste and then turn it into like a bio oil, like a really energy dense, mm. thick uh, um, material that you can store in geological formations, similar to oil, basically underground, and then uh, keep it safely there for for on the order of millennium. Cool. So I'd like to share gears a bit and uh, maybe talk about where we are today uh, in CDR and where do we need to be. So there's a very interesting report that came out at the beginning of this year called the States of uh, Carbon Dioxide Removal Reports. And they estimate that today we remove um, approximately like 2 billion tons of um, CO2 per year. But it's mostly coming from, um, let's say, conventional or like classic techniques like reforestation, like land-based methods, uh, which have a lot of co-benefits. And that's great. We should do a lot of those. But uh, they're not like permanent or like long duration uh, storage because the storage can be can be reversed and it, it's only like 0.1 percent that is in a new type of approaches most of it biochar but there's all like all the new techniques we talked about basically they they don't they practically don't exist on the field right now so it would be interesting to zoom into some of these techniques to find out what is actually being built today and deployed and um looking at how it scales, like what it looks like at gigaton scale. So maybe let's start with Director Capture, my dear. Can you tell us what, like on the field, what does it look like today, Director Capture? I mean, there, there are loads of good signals, right? So, so, but we are very small at the moment. So there's only one operating direct air capture plant in the world, and that's, that's, that's called the Orca plant. It's built in Iceland um, by, by Climeworks, and it captures 4,000 tons per year. So 4,000 tons. I mean, it's, it, it's fantastic that it's there because it's the stepping stone to, yeah. to, to lots more to come, right? So, so then Climeworks has, has, has immediately followed up with, uh, with a, a second plant that's called Mammoth. And um, they're constructing it now. So, so the ground has been broken uh, on that construction. Um, and, and that's going to be almost 10, 10 times the size of that. But that's still, um, you know, that, that we need to be in 2050 at about a gigaton scale, so a billion tons per year of CO2 that, that needs to be removed, more or less, by, by direct air capture. So, so an, uh, you know, an, an impressive scale up needs to happen. I, we need to scale this quicker than we have scaled solar, solar energy. Uh, and I think solar energy was one of the success stories. Yeah, it's super interesting you make this parallel because sometimes people react like, oh, it doesn't exist today, there's almost nothing, it cannot happen. But yeah, we've seen with solar photovoltaics, we've seen with batteries and other technologies, this learning curves of cost declining and as we build more capacity. Uh, I think it would be interesting to picture like what, what does it look like a gigaton scale direct air capture activity like, uh, and what could be some of the bottlenecks mm. on, on that way to gigaton scale basically? I mean, I, I think very much like you, you find solar farms now in, in, you know, around countries like Germany and the Netherlands and in and, and, and many countries in the world, really. Uh, what we will have is direct air capture farms and, and then probably in regions that are either close to CO2 storage locations or close to um, vast amounts of, of, of 
low carbon energy because that's also a prerequisite for direct air capture. It unfortunately costs energy to, to, to capture um, CO2 from the air. Um, there, there are some nice renders if anybody's interested. <laughs> there are some nice renders out there on, on, on the web. For instance, if you Google Project Bison, they have beautiful renders of, of how such a field full of direct air capture machines could look. Um, the bottlenecks, I, I think what, what people often forget is that I, I think there's a, there's a very hopeful amount of direct air capture companies and startups, and, and they're actually they're making headway. I mean, carbon engineering and, and, and 1.5 um, are, 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 are building their first um, half a megaton per year plant. Um, Heirloom has a nice pilot plant in, uh, in California. Um, there, there's, there's a number of companies that are building pilot plants in the UK at the moment, so, so there, there's a lot going on, and that's really hopeful. Yeah. The two bottlenecks that I see are sufficient CO2 transport and storage infrastructure, because if you capture the CO2, then you only capture it, but you, you need to permanently store it. It needs to be permanent, that's very important, otherwise it's not removal. So, so that needs to be in, in geologic formations, or if you want to do it above the ground, in, in solid minerals, in, 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 in basically mineralize it with rock. Then the other thing is that, of course, you need uh, a lot of energy, and it needs to be clean energy, because otherwise you're still emitting too much CO2 while removing the CO2 from the atmosphere, and that's, of course, yeah, not the best idea. And I think it's important to realize that that energy may come on top of the energy that we already have budgeted in for our electric cars, electrification of industry, electrification of homes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and you know, so that makes it extra important to be also as, as energy efficient as we can in everything that we do, um, to make sure that we also have sufficient renewable or, or low carbon energy for for direct air capture. Absolutely, thank you, my notes. Um, Kara, maybe we can zoom in on uh, so some example of deep early deployments of geochemical carbon removal. What, what does it look like today? What do you see happening? Yeah, well, one one thing that that I can point out is that this. The ORCA project in Iceland and this upcoming Mammoth project actually use mineralized storage. Now that's the storage side, it's not the, the <coughs> capture side, um, but it's the same process. And, um, and so, yeah, so the, the current rate is about 4,000 tons per year, but it will soon be going up. Um, there's also been some recent deployments of an enhanced weathering, I think much less. Um, but this year, I think C this Can you year describe a bit the operation? Like, like when you say yeah. deployment and enhanced weathering, what does it look like for people who are not familiar, like they can picture it basically? Right, yeah. So enhanced weathering, um, if we think about terrestrial enhanced weathering on farmland, that's basically taking crushed rock. So you can crush basalt, for example, mm -hmm. or a rock called olivine, which reacts a lot faster, but it's also a volcanic rock. Um, there's other ways you can do this. You can take concrete, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you crush it finely and you can spread it on fields. And what this does is it, it raises the pH of the field but it, the, the, and it interacts with the CO2 in the soil, which is higher than the atmosphere because the soil is full of microbes. Um, and, you know, and the soil is also full of water. So you have the things that you need and then um, reacts, you end up getting um, carbon storage in the form of bicarbonate, which is dissolved in water and then that bicarbonate can can go through the water table and go through out to rivers and eventually into the ocean where it it helps with with uh, the ocean alkalinity and what's interesting is that it also has co-benefits for for farming itself right yeah that yeah thanks so yeah um, so studies so far so a lot of it's new and a lot of the research is new but we are seeing a lot of studies that are showing that um, you get improved crop yield you have improved soil health um, and maybe more importantly, you can reduce fertilizer use, like reduce your fertilizer, um, reduce the amount of pesticides, and also some farmers use lime to do exactly this, to neutralize the, the acidity in the soils. So um, there are a lot of ways you can not only remove carbon, but also lower the original footprint of the, of the farm in the first place. And so you've done some road mapping exercise at RMI to, to basically look at how can we build a gigaton scale geochemical carbon removal industry and what are like the bottlenecks that are going to prevent. So can you tell more about those? Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so I mean, one of it, some of it's just like getting a bunch of rock and grinding it, right? But that's something that, that we already do as humans. We, we, we mine things and we, we, we move it around. So like the concrete industry, there's like lots of industries you can think of that, that move around massive amounts of rock um, and crush it and grind it. So there's actually a lot of feedstock available to do this. And a lot of the feedstock is actually more reactive than if you were to just go and mine new rock uh, in the first place. Um, for, for some of it, the, the bottlenecks are not so much in the technologies, but in the, the measurement of this. So how do you know that you removed the carbon in the first place? And how do you measure it? Um, we know that it's mostly a, a permanent process with some caveats that I won't get into, but more or less, it's, it's a permanent process. You've turned it to rock. It's not going to go back in the atmosphere. But you need to measure that you've done that. And so for closed systems, for the, you know, if you put the, the rock and the CO2 and everything in a, in, a, in a reactor, and then you, you mineralize it, and you've got this material, which you can use afterwards, by the way, as a building, you know, in building materials and stuff. Um, so you can commoditize that. But if you, if you do it in that way, it's pretty straightforward to measure. If you do it in an open system, like on a farm or in an ocean, um, it's quite difficult to measure. So we need a lot of innovation yeah. in terms of um, measurement, measurement techniques, uh, you know, networks of sensors, things like that. Yeah, and we're going to get into like, this topic of MRV just after. Super, super, super interesting thing. Thank you, Kara. Um, so, Frog, what's interesting is that with Frontier, you have like a really like a, a bird's eye view on everything that's happening at the early stage of uh, of CDR. So, can you give uh, examples of like early deployments you see from your your portfolio? Um, sure. I mean, in, in general, I think it's really good. Or should, we should we should emphasize that we've seen a lot of uh, innovation happening and a, a lot of movement in the field. You know, like we ourselves have seen, like last year, for example, in you know, our applications have doubled within just like six months. We've seen the whole field, like the, the venture capital investments that are going into carbon removal um, have gone up like by a factor of 10. We, we've seen a lot of uh, purchase money going in, so a lot of buyers enter the market. Um, but as a reality check, as, as Mani had hinted to, it's, we are very far from where we want to be. So this figure of gigaton scale is, is always good to come back to and check. Um, you know, we could ask if I could see the audience, uh, what do you think we have removed today in, in permanently carbon uh, removal? And, and the answer is uh, on the order of like 10,000 tons, which is very far away from, from gigaton scale, obviously. So there's a lot more to do and a long way to, to go. Um, we, we think, so there's like two pieces to it. Like on one hand, we need a lot more buyers actually to enter the market. So, you know, if you look at Frontier, you think like $1 billion, like close to $1 billion to spend is, is like such a huge amount of money that must catalyze the field. And, you know, we, we believe we're doing that and we, we see that happening. But on the other hand, if you just project out, let's say we assume, um, you know, price of like $100 a ton, uh, of carbon and then you want to remove on the order of, as you, you said it, like yeah. three, five, ten gigatons per year, you all of a sudden realize there's a trillion dollar industry <laughs> that, that you need to buy carbon removal. So we need a lot more buyers to enter and, and ultimately governments to pick up. Um, you know, we, we see um, tailwinds. For example, you know, you've uh, heard about the Inflation Reduction Act in the... In the um, uh, U.S. government, which has a lot of um, implications, for example, for technologies like direct air capture. So there's a lot happening. We need a lot more of that to really uh, build the compliance and stable market that we need. Um, and then on the other hand, of course, we need more solutions. We, we talked about it many times already, or like we hinted at it, the portfolio approach. We think there's probably even like novel approaches out there that we've seen that there's a lot of innovation here in the room and and at the comp like at the at the event we've seen a lot of uh, amazing startups um, here too pitching their new approaches to um, carbon removal and that's that's fantastic we we need more of that this is you know the decade we probably should have figured it out a decade ago <laughs> but uh, in the in the absence of time travel this is the time to figure out um, what to do and how to get it done as quickly as possible 
Um, one thing that we did to like last year to help that, for example, was like or like to push a little bit on that piece of like bringing as many uh, approaches as possible to the starting line is um, publishing a database on knowledge gaps in carbon removal. So I encourage you to check it out. Um, there's a lot of things in there, as Kara said, on um, measurement and verification, fundamental science gap, but also engineering needs or needs in, in governance. There's a lot of needs to build the governance structures to support this, this emergent field of carbon removal. Yeah, and I invite everyone to check it out. It's an amazing resource. Like if you want to work on CDR and you don't know from where to start, what kind of sub problem to tackle, like the, the gap database is like really, really exciting. Um, so you've talked a bit about um, what people in the field call MRV, which is the acronym you, 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 um, you come across like over and over and over when you start to dig into carbon removal. So MRV stands for uh, monitoring, reporting, uh, or monitoring or measurement, uh, reporting and verification. So the idea is basically how do you ensure that the removal actually takes place and that the storage actually is stable for uh, long time scales? Because what we don't want to have is to reproduce the, the, the challenges we've seen with the historical voluntary, voluntary carbon markets, the one that works with avoided emissions, not CDR, because we've seen, like for instance, there was a massive scandal for uh, Vera, which, uh, which, was, um, which is still a certifier of uh, this type of offsets, where you know, it's not really credible. Maybe there's some of the offsets that didn't really, didn't really happen. So the question is, we really want to build this field in a way that's really um, trustworthy, basically, so people can be uh, can trust that the CDR actually happens. So um, and it's important to mention that the challenge is maybe not the same for every technique. So it would be cool to illustrate, like for direct air capture and for enhanced weathering, for instance, uh, it's quite different. So maybe, Minder, you can start to tell us how it would work for DAC. Yeah, and I think DAC is perhaps one of the, the more uh, simple ways to, to monitor and, and verify the, 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 the real CO2 removed. I mean, you have to imagine that the, the CO2 that is captured by direct air capture is, is, is basically it's concentrated, right? From very low concentrations in the air to, to, very, to almost pure CO2. So you, you can literally measure with, with, with normal existing flow uh, meters, for instance, how, how much CO2 such a, a plant produces. And the same in, in the transport, if, if there are minute losses in the transport systems, we will have flow meters at the beginning and at the end. Um, measuring exactly how much goes in and how much goes out and, and, and also the, the, the injection of CO2 in, into the subsurface is relatively well uh, developed so, so the monitoring of that we, we know how to do that uh, with a combination of, 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 of sending and, and modeling etc. So, um, I, I mean, in that case, you, you have to imagine that you would do, uh, you, you would have sensors, for instance, at the surface, but also in, in, in sensing wells where, with equipment that pick up how, you know, where the CO2 is in, 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 the, in the geological formations. Um, so, I think that's, that's perhaps one of the easier ones. And yeah. that MRV, is, it, it still needs to be developed, right? Because the, it, if you want people to buy and sell removals, then they need to have confidence that what yeah. they buy uh, is actually what they get. Yeah. So, so um, from front to, to, to the end of that, yeah. that, that value chain still needs to be developed, but potentially it's one of the more, more simple ones. What about enhanced weathering, Kara? Is it as easy? No, <laughs> no, it's not as easy, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, for enhanced weathering, you can imagine if you're spreading rock onto soil, how do, you, how do you figure out what's happened? Um, and there's a lot that can go into it. A lot of it depends on even like crop type. Um, but really what you need to do is you need to be measuring the, the soil water. Um, but you might also want to measure the soil itself, which means you need to take a sample to a lab and have somebody who's trained, like a grad student, for example, um, measure what's in the soil and then you know you might also want to look at the the carbon fluxes just above the soil so there's there's at least three ways you 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 might want to use in order to get a complete picture now i don't know i don't know if anybody knows but um which parameters are going to be the parameters we're going to measure when we do this at a larger scale i'm not going to say gigaton scale yet because first we need to get to megaton scale but um the, the measurement techniques that are being used for a lot of the research experiments are not necessarily scalable. You can't, 
scale, uh, you know, taking a bunch of measurements into a lab and have grad students, you know, check, check what's in there. So, um, so I think we're going to need a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of work, a lot of research yeah. uh, in advance to know what we can model, um, what we need to measure, what, what can be modeled, and, um, you know, where are the uncertainties. Thank you, Kara. And Frauke, maybe, so as, as the buyer of carbon removal, obviously this is something you're looking at, right? The MRV, like, can you tell us exactly how you integrate it in your process? Yeah, absolutely. As a, I mean, from a buyer's perspective, MRV or like measurement and the verification of removal is absolutely critical because, you know, businesses want to apply, you know, the carbon they purchases against their neg 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 negative claims and also just in general need to know that a carbon, like, or that a credit they purchase or like a ton they purchased is also like a ton permanently removed. You just need the assurance of that. There's also, I mean, the insurance piece we, we don't need to get into, but um, in general, so it's, it's really important, especially to unlock more buyers to come into, right? For, to give them the assurance they need um, that whatever they purchase is in fact being b removed and can be verified at high confidence. And that's something that we, um, really care about strongly, so, so we really work with the ecosystem trying to figure out how can we um, verify carbon removal across these like very diverse set of technologies, and, and we said it before, it's very different in direct air capture, you have your plant, you suck the CO2 from the air, you release it from your sorbent, you can measure how much it is, you can pump it underground, you can monitor your well, you are, you know, on that side, you know, maybe your challenge is to, to do your life cycle analysis, like where you set your system level boundaries. And, and I think that's a little bit of a challenge there, but, you know, definitely solvable um, on the open systems, as, as Kara said, and open systems we call, you know, like all the ocean approaches, anything that's happening openly in, in the environment. And there is just very complex, depends on a lot of environmental factors. There's a lot of different things going on. If you put alkaline minerals in the ocean and dissolve them, it's very difficult to accurately measure and it changes, you know, like from site and whatever you do. The approach that we are taking is um, trying to be um, or develop methodologies carefully to, first of all, define uncertainties, like what are the pieces that contribute to an uncertainty in a certain technology. So for example, in the alkaline uh, mineral dissolving in the ocean um, system, if we talk about that, you know, the dissolution kinetics and the dynamics on like how the rock sinks, how it's dispersed and what's happening, like all these things play a role. So first you define all the factors that are contributing to your uncertainty. And then, as Kara said, like one piece that's really key here to improve our methodologies is data. And that's like a lot of data and available data. So we need to measure um, a lot. We need to build a lot of like tools and sensors to reduce that uncertainty, basically, so that we know, you know, like what can we measure, what's happening in a best case, in a worst case, and, and what are the different factors that influence our carbon removal behavior in these um, open systems. And then um, we also have to be comfortable with, um, I think, or like what we call irreducible um, uncertainty. So basically a last piece that we probably, due to environmental factors like very, uh, variation in, in the environment and different systems, things that we can never know for sure. You know, there's a storm one day when we have dispersed our rock in the ocean and then everything is different. So what you can do is basically um, apply like a discount to your uh, carbon removal technology, right? So you spread a mound of rock and you, you think that's what you can reduce for sure in the, in the worst case. In the best case, you remove more carbon, but in the worst case, that's what you reduce, like remove um, for sure, so you can just count for that. And I think that's, that's um, an approach because the open systems have like um, some promise in terms of like being maybe easier to scale or at low cost and then again You know because of all the different drawbacks of different approaches like they all come at some kind of cost we again End up back with like needing in a portfolio approach like lots of different solutions working in tandem. Yeah 
Excellent. Thank you, Frauke. And so we, so we know we're going to have to, to build this massive uh, industry that basically will have to be in the range of like 10 gigaton per year um, in the second half of the century, approximately. And uh, so it's basically twice the size of the oil and gas industry, but working in reverse to put stuff back in the ground. Uh, we have in the room and online on the live streaming, uh, scientists, engineers, founders, large companies, investors, policymakers. Um, what, what do you want to tell them as like the call to action for how they can engage with, uh, with carbon removal and get on board? Anyone can take it. I mean, speaking for Doc, we need to, you know, we need to act at three different levels, right? So, so there are companies who, have, who are ready to build their first commercial size plants, and we need, we need to get building, to get deploying at scale. So that's, that's the first thing. Then there is several dozens of, of startup companies that are not yet at a pilot plant scale, right? And you can help them probably reach that, that pilot stage really quickly because at the risk of their technology, and it's really important. At the same time, we need a lot of investment into, into R&D, uh, academic research, and company research, but preferably also academic research. I'm just saying that for my own, <laughs> you know, in my own interest, but um, because we need a lot of more, in, you know, information that becomes publicly available, uh, so that investors can make the right decisions based on, you know, reliable data and, and, and so on and so on, and governments and governments as well. Yeah, and I think one thing to add here is like, oftentimes people, when I talk to them, think uh, you need a certain skill set or you need to be of a certain profession to work in carbon removal, and it's absolutely not true or like doesn't match the reality. Like in all climate tech solutions we see here, like uh, exhibited in this uh, conference, it's it's truly an all hands on deck uh, endeavor that we are all in. So any skill set can be applied to carbon removal. We need physicists like building tools and sensors, and we need you know lawyers figuring out like governance structures and how to do permitting for field trials that we need. And we need you know like microbiologists to look at like interactions with minerals and and uh, soil microbiome. And there's like all kinds of different skill sets. We need even you know. Robotic, robotics engineers and software engineers but to even, figure out. Even marketers. Yeah. I think one thing <laughs> carbon removal needs is, is, is marketing in some sense because there's a lot science of mis communicators. Yeah, please. science communicators. There's a lot of misconceptions. Yeah. Like thank you cards, for instance. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so we need, we need people, we need all skill sets. Um, we, because we can it's an entire ecosystem that needs to be built, not just... Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I cut you off. But no, no, it's, okay. it's absolutely true. And, you know, again, you can basically use the database that we published on the, on the innovation and, and research needs in carbon removal where you can see, like, a whole sweep of skill sets that are needed to, to build these, or, like, to answer and address these different uh, challenges. So... There's a room, room for everyone here. Amazing. Thank you so much for the three of you. Uh, we are already a bit over time, but thank you so much for your attention. I'm sure some of you have questions. We'll be obviously with the speakers here a little longer at the event, so please come and, and talk to us. Thank you so much for your attention, and thanks to our great speakers for, for today.